welcome this Sunday. Beautiful sun outside. Much to be grateful for. Amen. Amen. Well, we welcome here to you to this Sunday service as we gather again today to worship you. Worship God, I should say. Worship him for all his goodness, his grace, his provision, his protection. He gave us life this morning, so we're able to be here to see one another, fellowship with one another, then we give God thanks. Let's all stand in his house. We welcome you, those online who are joining us. Let's really focus our hearts on him this morning and worship him. Give him thanks and praise for he is good. Amen? Hallelujah. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. We thank you that you are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. You are Jehovah Jireh. You are our bright and morning star. You are our everything, and we give you thanks, and we give you praise. We thank you for bringing us in your house today, Lord God, that we're able to come together to fellowship and just lift up holy hands, lift up our voices of praise to you in adoration of who you are. And I just pray that as we are here, Lord, that you will help us to focus our eyes and our hearts on you and allow whatever it is that you desire to tell us today through worship, through speech, Lord Father, that you would speak to our hearts and we'd be open to receive it in your mighty name. And all of God's beautiful people say, amen, amen, amen. amen.
you, Jesus. Your name is above every other name. Thank you, Jesus. We serve an awesome God. His name is above everything. Hallelujah.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, 
Finally now, in that, in that same heart of worship, we are about to go into communion. Holy communion is a sacred time of fellowship with God. As we remember the sacrifice that our Lord Jesus made for us on the cross of Calvary, we are here to remember the love that Jesus has for us. He gave his life for our salvation in order to save us from the bondage of sin and death. So receiving the Holy Communion this morning, it cleanses us from past sins and should strengthen us against future sin. We'll be reading in, from 1 Corinthians 11 shortly. There we'll learn that as often as we eat this bread and drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death. If we proclaim the Lord's death, we proclaim the forgiveness of our sin. The word proclaim is continuous. It's an ongoing active confession. Once we accept our Lord Jesus Christ, we have received the full redemption and received the benefit of his forgiveness, strength, wholeness, and health, and his sufficiency in everything we do. So when we have communion together as a body of Christ, it reminds us of the unity of the church and our responsibility as believers who serve the same God to preserve the unity by what we do and what we say, to uplift each other, to help each other, to be there for each other and reach out to the world. So let us now read from 1 Corinthians 11, 23, 26, so that we can partake. It says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take it. This is my body, which was broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us partake of the bread together. Thank you, Father. In the same manner, He took, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till it comes. Let us partake of the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Let us pray. Let us pray. Let us pray. Okay, I can hear you now. Oh Lord, we thank you. Father, we glorify you. We thank you for your death on the cross of Calvary for our sin. We are proclaiming it this morning. Thank you for being there for us. Thank you for saying it is finished. All our heartaches are finished. All our lack is finished. All our sickness is, is finished. All our needs are met. Hmm. All our things that will push us forward are provided. Lord, it is finished. All those problems we are facing is finished. Lord Jesus, this is a week of Valentine. We thank you because you first loved us. You are the lover of our soul. You love us enough to die for us. Oh, Father, we thank you. We thank you because you are good to us. We thank you that despite it all, no matter what we are going through, you are there. You are good. 
you are wonderful. You are merciful. You are gracious to us. We thank you for all the finished work that you did for us on Calvary. We remember that and we will continue to remember it each time we are facing a difficult time. That it is your word that you said it shall not return to you void without fulfilling what you have sent it. We receive it this morning. Forgive us for our doubt, for our unbelief. Father, we pray for marriages this morning. Father, heal wounds. We pray for families this morning. Meet needs, Lord. We pray for those who are looking for you, looking unto you to meet one situation or the other. As I said, this is a week of Valentine and love. Father, let us continue to remember that you love us more than life itself. Oh, Father, that for those who are looking unto you for a partner, for a wife, for a husband, you provide someone for, for them that you have made that will be from their rib of ribs in the mighty name of Jesus. For those who are about to get married, you will make sure they marry right. For those who are married, oh, you heal those broken hearts. You will heal and mend them. And you continue to save our marriages. You will save our world. Father, we thank you again because you are good. We thank you because you are wonderful. We thank you because you are merciful, because you are gracious. You are our God. You are omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient. We thank you for what you have done, what you are doing, what you will do. We thank you because you, you are our Abba Father, the Lord of Lords, the God of Gods. We thank you for the forgiveness of sin because you said it is finished. It is finished. We thank you. We thank you for even being able to partake in your bread and blood this morning your body that you have broken down for us. Father, we are grateful. We are grateful. Father, as we even have been here today to receive, give us double portion of your anointing in Jesus' name. Father, all the baggages we brought here today and we'll leave it at your altar. Father, do not let it go back home with us. All the sicknesses that are healed today, do not let it come back again. Oh, Father, we bless your name. We glorify you. We thank you for your finished work again on the cross. We bless you. We bless you. We bless your name, Father. Father, continue to guide us. Continue to direct us. Continue to mold us. Continue to build us up as families. You said we are brothers keepers. Let us continue to do that. Let us continue to reach out to the needy. Oh, Father, thank you. And as we meet needs, continue to meet ours too. Father, we glorify you. We praise your name. So you'll be all the glory, honor, and adoration. In Jesus' mighty and wonderful name we have prayed. Amen. Amen. And a big amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. And in the same breath, we've read that we are brothers keepers. We are meant to look after each other. We are meant to do well. Hug, kiss, shake hands, elbow, say hello. You're all welcome. Thank you.
morning. I know you love to greet one another, but we have lots on the go this morning. A special welcome to all of you who are visiting with us for the first time this morning. We're so glad you've joined us. You should see in the seat back uh, in front of you a card that looks like this. And if you are new to us this morning, we would be very grateful if you would fill this out, bring it to one of the hospitality team or to myself. I will be out in the lobby at the end of service and I will exchange this for a gift for you. Uh, we have several announcements this morning. First is we invite you to join us tomorrow night at 6.45 for our in-house prayer night. Uh, Monday night prayer is a wonderful time of worship, prayer. We pray for the community, for the church, for individual needs, and uh, love worshiping and giving testimony to all the prayers that God has answered. So um, we trust that you will join us tomorrow night at 645. And for all the men, your Super Bowl party is here tonight starting at 630. I know some of the women are envious. We would love to join you, but this is for men of all ages. There's still an opportunity to sign up. Um, the sign-up sheet is out in the lobby, and you can do that after service today. If you still haven't paid, you can do that as well. Um, our parking lot team, which you've seen in action for a number of weeks, yes. For sure. They are doing a wonderful job. Um, there is an opportunity to join them in the important work that they're doing, and there is a sign-up sheet for that out in the lobby. Now that we see um, a little bit warmer weather and some sunshine out, it's a bit more appealing than it has been the last two weeks in the blizzard and the rain, so I know you'll want to get out there and work on your tans. Um, Next week is our Family Day service, and I know you're not going to want to miss it. We have the opportunity to witness with a number of people who are going to be uh, water baptized and a whole lot of people who are going to become new members here at Southside. And so that's a real reason for celebration. But I would ask you through this week to pray for the service, for all of the people involved as um, they lead up to making that, those commitments next week. Um, the next announcement is really a save the date. Um, during March break, we will be having some family and kids activities here, some kids side events. Uh, there will be an event during the day on Monday, March the 13th, so make sure you save the date for that. And there will be another activity on Wednesday, March 15th in the evening. Okay. And now I welcome Pastor Josh. Thank you, Pastor Melanie. Well, I want to thank you for your faithfulness in giving the Lord's tithe and our offerings. Uh, we can't do what God's called us to do if the church isn't faithful. And this church is faithful, and I commend you for that. And uh, I want to share with you, it might not be that exciting, but it's sort of exciting because uh, people have been asking this for a while, but I want to tell you today about a new way that you can actually give. So uh, at this point, when we get to this part of our service, we often say, you know, there's the boxes at the back that you can give if you brought your, if you're offering that way, or you can go online to our website, www.southsidewc.com, and you can give uh, online through that way, or today and moving forward, if you want to give via our Interact debit machine, you can, you can do that. So I know some of you have been asking for that. It's very convenient. And so I want to take a second just to walk through a couple things with you. Uh, this is great for even the ladies events. You know when we did a ladies event and we tortured you by making it $15 and we had to send Maureen out to the bank to get a bunch of fives so that we could break her 20s? Well, now you can just sort of do that on here. Uh, but I wanted to share a couple things related to, uh, to use this, especially if you're giving your tithes and your offerings so that you can get a tax receipt at the end of the year. So it's really important for you to remember that when we get that little receipt, 
we have no idea of telling who that person is. It just gives us a number, right? And so what you need to do is if you're going to do that, uh, you need to fill out an envelope like you would if you were going to put in cash or a check and just fill it out with your name. If we don't have your address, we need that address. And then, of course, um, uh, sort of you can write in your number on the thing. And then you can put the receipt that comes out, put it in here, and then you can drop it in one of the offering boxes. For those of you that are concerned about fees, because I know that, uh, that you are, I just want to be really transparent with you so that you have the best information so that you can make the best decision. Uh, it's actually not that expensive. So if you use your Interact or debit, right, like your bank card, it just costs us 10 cents per transaction, okay? If you decide to use your visa, it's 1.8%, I think, is what, uh, is what the visa company. And something that I learned as well, just you can tuck this away, uh, for those of us that have um, rewards cards, right, where you get like 1% back, they actually give that uh, cost to the company, right? So uh, if you have a rewards card and you use that, uh, not only is the 1.8% that's taken, but then the 1% or whatever your rewards are worth. So just wanted to give you that information so that you can make a decision uh, that, that uh, best serves you and best serves our church. And uh, we're excited that we've just made it easier for you to uh, give that way. So Pastor Melanie is going to be at the back after the service uh, to help if you're sort of wondering what to do or different things like that. But we want to make that available uh, to you uh, as another way that you can give. Just have uh, two special announcements to make before we get into uh, the word. Uh, today, we don't always do this, but today we want to celebrate uh, someone who has a special milestone birthday. So John Hanner, I'm sorry John, you don't know that I'm doing this today, but John is actually turning 90 today. And so John, just give a wave from over there. Uh, John, we recognize you and honor you. Um, don't worry, it wasn't your wife that told me. It wasn't your wife that told me, it was someone else. Uh, but uh, we just bless you today, John, and, uh, and a happy 90th birthday to you. And we also want to recognize some special guests that we have with us. Uh, Jeff, and, Jeff and Helen Laird are with us. Jeff, and, just stand up for a second so that we can uh, acknowledge you. Uh, just, just welcome them today. Uh, Jeff and Helen are actually the assistant uh, to the superintendent of the Eastern Ontario District. So uh, as, as Southside Worship Centre, we're a part of a family of Pentecostal churches, and we belong to a district. And so Jeff is like one of my pastors, right? And so Jeff uh, is a very busy man. He just started in December, and he's normally around with churches to help them, especially when they're in transition with a lead pastor. And uh, today he had the Sunday off, so he decided to come and to visit us. And so we welcome you, Jeff, and thanks for uh, your role. And uh, make sure you say hi to Jeff before, uh, before you leave today. Well, uh, we do all those things, and we're about to get into the Word, but I think it would be good for us just to refocus before we do that. So why don't we stand together? And I've asked the band just to lead in a chorus of one of the songs that we already sang. Let's just take this moment to reposition our hearts so that we're ready to receive from God today in His Word. So uh, join the band as they lead us in this song. words as we refocus our hearts to know that you serve a good God. You serve a God who is with you in the valley. He is with you on the mountaintop. As you continue to worship him, as you continue to praise him, he will deliver you from whatever circumstance you're going through physically, mentally, financially, whatever it is, he will bring breakthrough. He will be your testimony. Thank you, Jesus.
Lord, we recognize today that you are holy, that you are worthy, that you are wonderful. God, this is our testimony. And Lord, I pray today that as we open up your word and we prepare to receive from you, God, that your word would find good soil in our hearts. And Lord, we would be ready to take what we hear and apply it to our lives so that God, we can share our testimony and the testimony that you've given us to others so that others may come to know and discover you as their Lord. So bless your people now, Lord, as they receive your word. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Well, tonight, millions of people will tune in to watch the NFL Super Bowl game. Over the years, uh, the Super Bowl has become sort of like a pop culture event, right? There's lots of different people that watch. It, It doesn't really matter if you like football or if you've ever watched football. Many people tune in for this championship game. Some are there to watch the watch the game. Others are there, uh, you know, for the halftime show. Some are there for the commercials. A lot of people are there just for the food. Uh, But for the final two uh, teams, this is a big deal, right? For the Kansas City Chiefs and the Philadelphia Eagles, uh, they've been working all year for for this moment. In many cases, uh, tonight is fulfilling the dreams of some of these players that they've had since they were, were children. And over the last several months, they've been navigating through the ups and the downs of this season to get to this point. I remember watching Patrick Mahomes, the quarterback of the Kansas City Chiefs, a couple weeks ago. He was literally at the end of the game limping down the field to ensure that his team would win and go to the Super Bowl. In the the dying moments, he's doing whatever it can take to, to make sure that his team is there. These players have fought all season long to get to this point so that they can compete tonight for the for the ultimate prize in football, the the championship. And although you might not be a big football fan or know anything about the sports, tonight they are finishing up a year-long competition to determine what team is the best. Well, whether you realize it or not, uh, you're actually in a competition as well. Did you know that? As, as, as Paul says in Philippians 3, 12 to 14, we're, we're running this race, right? This race that's heaven-bound towards Jesus. And uh, although many of us have repented of our sins and we've asked Jesus to uh, come and we've received that gift of salvation, the, the journey that we're on is, is not over. In fact, when you invite Jesus to be the Lord of your life, that's really when the journey starts, Right? You might have been running before, but you were on a different path. And when you invite Jesus to be at the center of your life, all of a sudden you're on that right track that leads, that leads towards life. And my desire as your pastor is that you would fight the good fight of faith by running the race that God has for you. This morning we're going to look at a passage in 1 Timothy 6 where Paul encourages us to remain faithful 
on this race that we're on. And within our passage today, he uses the phrase, the famous phrase, fight the good fight. And that's actually what I've entitled this this sermon today. Now, sometimes Christians hear a phrase like fight the good fight, and they think that it gives them license to lace up the boxing gloves, right? And get ready for a fight, you know, to fight for their, for their faith. But it's interesting that when you dive into the meaning of the word fight in this passage, it means, it means something different than that. The word that Paul uses in the Greek for fight is not a military word. It's not a military word of an aggressive fight, but it's actually a competition word. So when you read or you hear the scriptures say, fight the good fight, our minds should go to the idea of a competition or a race and not be so quick to maybe go to an aggressive fight. If, if we were explaining this to someone, you could, you could almost rephrase the verse to say, compete in the good competition. Compete in the good competition. That's, that's really what Paul is telling Timothy and us to do. To recognize that, hey guys, there's a race going on. And we should compete to the very best of our ability to how God's called us to. Now there's this troubling trend that's emerging these days among Christians. Many have stopped training. We've stopped being intentional in running the races that God has for us with excellence. They may still attend church. They may identify as Christian. They may even do a bunch of religious activities, but but they're not running the race well. They're coasting, or they're wandering a bit. Or maybe they're even sitting on the sidelines and missing out on the opportunity to excel. To be honest, it can be easy in the world that we live in, right, to, to sort of be distracted by all the different things that are taking place, distractions that take our mind and our focus away from God and on to other things. We sometimes get distracted by, you know, things like work, family, entertainment, Netflix or Disney Plus or Facebook or even education, and and, and we're just sometimes so easily distracted. Sometimes we fall into the trap of caring more about what the world thinks than what God thinks. And so we spend our time and our energies trying to please people in the world rather than trying to please God. Or maybe we're just content with being on like the easy road where there's no accountability, there's no you know, push to, to sort of get better. But the reality is, is that these are all obstacles that the enemy puts in our pathway to try to distract us from from focusing in on on God. And as a result, when we do these things and face these distractions, we end up not fighting the good fight of faith well. And we struggle to remain faithful to God. The truth is, is that you can't succeed in this race that you're in, this, this competition, if Jesus is just an occasional thing in your life. If, if, if that's the kind of race that you're running, you won't be effective, you won't be successful. See, like, if, if your faith just consists of, you know, checking off boxes of religious, um, you know, things, like, oh, yeah, I, I did that, I went to church this week, or I read my Bible, or, or, I, or I prayed, you know, I looked at the verse of the day on my phone every single day this week. If, if that's it, that's not running the race well. It's like sort of going to the gym a few times, but you didn't actually make a rhythm or a habit of going to the gym. You might have some trophies that you've collected or, 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 are, or are on your shelf throughout the years, but, but you're not training to get to that ultimate prize that Jesus has for us. Well, this morning I want us to look at 1 Timothy 6, verses 11 to 19. And we're going to pull out some principles that... I believe will help you to run the race well, or as the language you'll use today, fight the good fight of faith with success and effectiveness. So let me read this passage for you. It'll appear on the screen behind me. 1 Timothy 6, 11 to 19 says, But you, man of God, 
Flee from all of this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life which you were called to when you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God who, gave, who gives life to everything and to Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession. I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and one and, and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in the unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see. To him be the honor and might forever. Amen. Verse 17 says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Com command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Well, this morning, as we look a little closer at this passage that we just read, I, I want us to uh, pull out some priorities that Paul gives to us so that we can run the race well. And, and the good news is, is that Paul actually gives us everything we need to know to fight the, the good fight of faith well. And so the first priority that Paul shares is to pursue a virtuous life. Pursue a virtuous life life. There's lots of different things that we can pursue in our life, right? Like our culture promotes this idea of pursuing whatever will make you happy. And so for some, they pursue fame, hoping that as they become more popular with either the world or at least their circle of friends, that, 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 they'll, that they'll feel that fulfillment. And so they, they work towards that. And then when they get it, they maintain it. For some, they pursue experiences, and it's all about going on this quest to fill their bucket list, right? To make sure all their bucket lists are filled. For others, they might not even realize this, and they might do this subconsciously, but they're actually on this, uh, on this journey to get validation. And they end up being on whatever path other people say that they should be on so that they can get their, their approval. There's many who are on this pursuit for money and, and wealth in hopes that as they accumulate more, it will lead to a more comfortable and fulfilling life. Here's a question for you to consider as we go through this message this morning. What's your life's pursuit? What's your life's pursuit? Like when you think about the life that you're living, what are your goals? What are you pursuing? Where is the life that you're living right now leading you? What are you putting your time, your energy, and your commitments towards? What's your life's pursuit? That's a good question to ask as a Christian because we want to make sure that we get this one right. And in our passage today, Paul helps us with understanding the kind of, of life that we should pursue. Essentially, in verse 11, he says, pursue a virtuous life. It said this, but you, man of God, flee from all of this. We'll look at that in a second. And pursue, here's the virtuous life, righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. So Paul starts by saying, flee all of this. And if we were to look back and read the previous verses that led up to our verse today, you would, you would hear Paul give a warning. He'd say, don't give in to the temptation of pursuing money, pursuing materials, because that's just temporary. To allow the, the, the lure of money and wealth to distract you is not a good thing if you're, if you're trying to pursue the virtuous life. You'd also read him talk about the warning to, and, and watch out for false prophets who tell you that pursuing prosperity and 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 wealth is the goal of your life. So we're to flee from pursuing materialism and wealth because that's not how we fight the good fight of faith. Instead, we're to pursue a virtuous life. Things like righteousness, godliness, faith, love, 
endurance and gentleness. Righteousness, right? That's, that's right living before God, where you live according to his standards. Godliness, where you're displaying to others this devotion and commitment to God. We should be people of faith who adhere and live by God's truth. People of love who are quick to show care and charity to others. People of endurance who, who learn to be patient and content even during the most difficult times. And we should be people of gentleness whose meek and humble spirit guides us in our interactions. These are some of the characteristics that as Christians we should have if we're, if we're striving to pursue that virtuous life. And so as you think about your life today, how, how do you need to pursue a virtuous life? What, what quality do you need to grow in? What characteristic do you need to develop? How do you need to pursue a virtuous life? The second priority that Paul shares to us today is to be a good witness. Now, I don't think it's by accident that this is the second theme or priority that, that, that Paul gives in this list. Because if you want to be a good witness, you really got to get the first priority right, right? You got to make sure that you're living uh, that, that virtuous life because there's nothing that puts people off more than a hypocritical Christian, right? Someone who, who says how it should be and what you should do, but then doesn't apply it or live by it themselves. People can spot a phony a mile away. And they'll ask themselves when all of a sudden you're telling them about your faith, they'll say, well, I don't know, what's, what's the point of doing it? Because I look and talk and act just like you. So what kind of change is it, is it going to make? 1 Timothy 6, the second part of verse 12 said, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of witnesses, many witnesses. Paul reminds Timothy of the confession he made, most likely the confession he made during his water baptism in front of others. So Timothy made this confession, and, and as we heard, next week there's going to be a handful of people that are making that good confession. But he confessed before others that, that he was going to live his life for Jesus. So that means living in a way that makes it really easy for people to see Jesus in the good and bad times in your life. Some of you know this, but if you don't, let me share this with you. You know that just because I'm a pastor doesn't mean that I don't have to constantly be thinking about this as well, right? Like, I'm a human being, too, just like everyone else, and it's easy for me to get frustrated, angry, short, or rude with others sometimes. If I were to allow myself, I could probably tell someone what I really thought about them in those stressful or tired or upset moments. I could do that. But part of running the race effectively is learning how to be a good witness and showing discipline even in those situations. To say a prayer in your spirit when you're tempted to, to let the fleshly side of you come out and say, God, in this moment, give me strength, endurance, give me gentleness, when you're tempted to respond in maybe a less than ideal way to others. Paul reminds us that if we're going to fight the good fight of faith well, we need to be a good witness. Now I know these days are difficult for many, and maybe you're feeling like, Pastor Josh, I am ready to burst. There's this person at work, or there's this husband of mine, or something that I'm just ready to give it to him. Can I tell you, those are opportunities for us to lean in to Jesus and to be a good witness even when it's tough. And so let me ask you this today. How do you need to be a better witness? How, how, how do your words and actions reflect Jesus? Do people see God in you when they look at you? How do you need to be a better witness? The third priority that Paul shares is to focus on God. Now, in many parts of the world, uh, focusing on God is a practice that people do daily. 
because they're daily calling out to God and, and asking him for example there for provision because they need their next meal. I, I, I've been to several countries where people literally have to pray that God would provide the food for that day. That requires a, a trust and a dependence on God. And this morning I want to remind you that even though you don't feel like this, we are actually very rich in compared to the rest of the world. Most of us have food in our fridge, a roof over our heads, and more than enough clothes to sustain us for the week. We may be feeling the sting of the economic turndown, but in comparison to many others around the world, we're rich. And so in verse 17, when Paul speaks to the rich, he's speaking to us. He's speaking to you and I. He says this in verse 17, Command those who are rich in the present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Paul reminds the rich, he reminds us not to focus on our wealth, because he's right, it's so uncertain, but to focus on God. These words that were spoken a couple thousand years ago were relevant then, and they're relevant now. We're living in a world that's put their trust and dependency on their, on their wealth. And so when the economy starts going down, people stress and they don't worry. But as Christians, we should remain confident because we don't put our trust in wealth. We put our trust in God who provides everything for us, everything that we need for our enjoyment. So maybe you're tempted today to, to shift your focus onto the different things that the world tells us to focus. Can I encourage you? Keep your focus on God. When I was a teenager, um, I, I took a driving course in preparation for my G2 license. And I remember one day I was out with the instructor and he took me to this large empty parking lot. And uh, we went over to the one side of the parking lot and he says, okay, Josh, I want you now to Put the car into reverse, and you're going to reverse all the way across the parking lot and find a parking spot, and I want you to back into it. The parking lot was maybe about 300 feet or so, so I was going to be driving backwards for a while. And so I remember I, I, I put the car in reverse, and I started driving, and the wheels going back and forth as I'm trying to keep my back end, you know, from, from sort of swerving back and forth. And eventually I made it. I thought I did, go, you know... I thought I did a good job, and, and I made it to the parking spot, and I pulled in. The instructor didn't say anything. He says, okay, Josh, now I want you to go back and do it again. I'm thinking, what did I do wrong? I got to where I wanted, and so I listened to him. I drove right back to where I was, and I stopped, and he says, now this time, when you look back, I want you to focus on the parking spot that you want to land in. And so this time, when I turned around, I focused on that parking spot that I was going to go in, and I went straight right back. I didn't have to, like, correct myself very often because I was focused on what my end goal was. Can I encourage you today to stay focused on God? Because if you take your focus off of God, you're going to be like me when I was backing up that first time. You're going to be sort of swerving a bit back and forth, trying to keep yourself straight because you're focusing on all the different things that are around you. But if, if you were to focus straight on to God, you'd be able to go right to where he's asking you to go. Ask yourself this question today as you reflect. How do I need to focus on God? Like what's happening in your world these days that's tempting you to focus on other things? How do you need to be intentional in locking your eyes and your focus on God and his purposes for you. How do I need to focus on, on God? Well, the last priority that Paul shares for us today in our passage is number four, be generous. Be generous. First Timothy 6, the last two verses, 18 to 19, says, Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. The Bible says that we should be people, Christians should be known for their love for one another, right? And, and, 
And the nice thing about love, the wonderful and beautiful thing about love is that it's so appealing because it's free and it's generous. If someone gives you their love, but it comes with a list of requirements, it doesn't really feel like love, does it? Or if someone gives you a little bit of love, but holds back on to their love, it doesn't have the same kind of effect. As Christians, Paul says that we should be generous with our love. And then that love should compel us to, to share with others, to be doing good deeds for one another. This is one of the priorities that, that Paul says that we should focus on so that we can fight the good fight of faith well. And if you think about it, our generosity actually produces some very positive outcomes for us. First, it helps us to take our mind off of all the other things that we could focus on. We know from Scripture that Money is something that can take the place of our heart. And so when we're generous and sharing it or giving it away, all of a sudden we take that thing that could get into our heart and we just, we give it away. We give it away and we allow God to stay in the center and we, and we let it be what it's supposed to be, which is a, a resource to be used for God's, God's glory. Being, being generous is, is a way to live the virtuous life, as we talked about earlier. But second, being generous is a way to be a good witness to others. It helps us to demonstrate to our friends, families, coworkers, and neighbors that, that we trust in something greater, right? That, that we're not living in constant fear of, will we have enough? But we serve a God who owns everything. And so if we're generous, we're giving God an opportunity to provide everything that we'll need as that previous scripture said, for our enjoyment. This morning, as you reflect, ask yourself this, how do you need to be generous? How do you need to be generous? Maybe you need to be a little bit more intentional in looking for opportunities to do good deeds. Perhaps you need to uh, break that fear that you have that you'll have enough and learn to start sharing with others. Maybe you need to start being obedient to the Lord and giving of your tithes and your offerings. Whatever your response is, let me encourage you to make a move today towards generosity. Because God will provide for us as we choose to obey Him and love others through our generosity. Can I share a testimony with you from this past year? As, as many of you know, this has been a difficult year for Lots of different people, and, and, and more and more people are needing access to a food bank. For those of you that don't know, we actually have a food bank that runs out of our church, and it's a, it's a fairly significant food bank. We serve many people. And this week, we actually just heard that the largest food bank in the Durham region has closed their doors for good. That's, that's the kind of need that there is these days, and, 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 and just they were struggling. And I'm so proud of Pastor Melanie and her, team of, and, and her team of volunteers who serve our community so faithfully every single week. Uh, this past year, we've served more people than we ever have before. And, it's, and it has to do with the fact that we're just doing what God's asked us to do and we're trying to serve as faithfully as, as we can. But can I tell you, there's been some times this year where we've had to exercise our faith. The, the philosophy that we have here at the church is whatever comes in, we give out. Whatever food comes in, we, we give out. And there's been some weeks where we gave it all away and we looked at our shelves and we thought, there's no more food left. What's going to happen next week when the same amount of people need, need that food? I remember one Thursday specifically, uh, the volunteers had noticed how, how the shelves were all empty and they actually stopped what they were doing on a Thursday. They gathered together and they prayed, God, just like you multiplied the food in the Bible where you took the two fish and the five loaves and you multiplied that for Jesus and the disciples, would you multiply that here at Southside for our food bank? They prayed that with faith on a Thursday. And you can imagine how excited we were when on Monday, three vanfuls of food showed up and filled all of the shelves again. Can I remind you, friends, that it's God that owns all the resources? He's just looking for people to be his conduits for generosity. 
He's looking for people who will have the faith to believe that if I just give the little that I have, that God will not only take care of me, but he'll bless others through me. So let me challenge you today to to fight the good fight of faith. Strive to be generous in all you do. And so ask yourself today, how do I need to be generous? I want to invite the band back to the platform as we close today. This morning, like I said, I want to encourage you to fight the good fight of faith. I know these days are difficult. I know that there's opportunity for us to wonder, God, are you going to come through? But these are moments where we can lean into God and say, God, you've got me on this race. There's some obstacles in front of me, but I'm going to faithfully go and keep running. And so I challenge you today, pursue a virtuous life. Flee those things that the world says that we should pursue and pursue what God says is a virtue in our life. Be a good witness. Allow your confession of faith to be evident in the way that you look, in the way you talk, in the way you act with others. Focus on God. When the world's trying to tell you to focus all over here and it's causing you to go in every different direction, focus in on God. And be generous. Look for opportunities to be used by God to bless others and be generous towards them. I want to invite you to stand with me as we sing this song of response today. I recognize that, you know, God's word always has a tension, right, between God's word and us. We're human beings and we're trying to say, okay, God, how does this apply? And what I've been talking about today requires a level of trust, a level of surrender, because all the challenge that we're, that we're facing can be overwhelming, can be tough. But I want to encourage you today, and this song is going to help us do this, to just surrender more of our lives to God. Surrender, it, surrender those things that you're tempted to focus on so that you can focus on what God has for you. So let's sing this song, Take My Life, and then I'll come back and give us a closing prayer and benediction. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of Thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Here I am, all of me. Take my life, it's all for thee.
invite you in this moment just to put your hands out like this as an act of surrender to God. Lord, you see these hands. And God, we recognize how much we need you today. And so, Lord, in this moment, we're saying, here we are. All of me, every part of me, even the parts that I'm tempted to hold on to, Lord, I give them to you. Take my life, God, all of me, and help me to be the person you've called me to be. Help me to go to the places you've asked me to go, and help me to fulfill the mission that you've asked me to. So, Lord, you see these hands? Lord, they, recognize, they, they, they represent people who are in different workplaces, in different neighborhoods, in different seasons of life. Lord, the people that are around us, the people that need to know about the good news of Jesus Christ, Lord, I pray that you would take all of us. Take us to those places where we can run the good race of, of faith, Lord. Run and fight the good fight of faith well. So, Lord, if we're afraid, God, I pray for, for courage. Lord, if we're doubting, Lord, I pray you'd give us confidence. Lord, if we're tired, I pray that you'd give us strength. And I pray, Lord, that as we move into this world, into this week, as you have it for us, Lord, that we would live out these surrendered lives before you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just before I give you our benediction for today, uh, maybe you're here this morning and, um, and, you know, we're talking about surrendering your life and you realize that you've never surrendered your life to Jesus before. You've never asked him to be the Lord of your life. We would love to have a conversation with you. We'd love to pray with you. There's going to be some prayer partners over here by the drum case at the end of the service. And they would love to talk with you and pray with you about that. I also recognize in a room this big, maybe you came today and you were just really hoping that someone would pray with you. That's a great opportunity to come up to the front and just to, just to ask someone in the privacy of that moment, can you pray for me about this? It's been really on my heart and I'm wrestling with it. And I know they would be happy to pray with you up there. Well, let me give you our benediction for this morning. This is just a blessing that as the pastor I can bestow onto you. And so may the God who is Lord over all give us confidence to keep our focus on him. May the Son who is our example help us to be a good witness to those all around us. And may the Spirit who is our helper guide us as we pursue all of God's virtues in our lives. And we pray these things in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Guys, don't forget, if you haven't signed up for Super Bowl, you can do that. We'll see you tonight at 6.30, and then we'll see you tomorrow night for prayer.
go to verse 1. Take my will and make it thine. It will be no longer mine. Make my heart, it is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. 